Hello Internet, this is Circuit from the Game Maker's Garage. In this video series, I'm going to teach you about the computer game Scorched Earth, and I'm going to show you how you can begin to program a similar game for yourself. Now, if you're not familiar with Scorched Earth, you probably are familiar with it, but you just don't remember it by name. Uh, it was a very popular game for MS-DOS back in the 1990s, and it has been recreated several times since on several different platforms. Basically, you had a battlefield, on the battlefield you have several tanks scattered about, each one controlled by a different player, and the players would take turns shooting at each other, and whoever was left alive was the winner. <laughs> it wasn't the most intellectual game, but I enjoyed it, and a lot of other people did too. In this first video, we'll look at the terrain in Scorched Earth. We'll consider the various ways that it can be stored in memory, and we'll also consider the various ways that it can be generated, both with design tools and with a random generator. In the second video, we'll dive into the mathematics that are used to generate the terrain using the method that I think is best. And in the third and final video, I'll show you the code. I don't consider myself an expert in math or programming, so if you notice any errors in the videos, uh, please feel free to point them out in the comments section. If there are any corrections to be made, I'll make those corrections using annotations. We should start by making some observations. An important thing to notice here is that the ground is very dense. It's completely settled like sand. You can see that all the sand is on the bottom and all the empty space is above it and there is no empty space below ground. Now there are occasionally holes in the ground. When you have an explosion it can create empty space below the surface. But that hole is only there for a moment. It fills in very quickly and the earth is dense again. Now this is an important observation to make because it's going to inform our decisions about how to generate the terrain and how to store it in memory. There are a couple of different ways that you can store the terrain data in memory. The first way, which might seem most natural, is to use a two-dimensional array. Now this two-dimensional array mirrors the screen image. It tells you which pixels are sand, and which pixels are empty space. Now the other way, which is less natural but more efficient, is to use a one-dimensional array. Now this one-dimensional array is used to store the height of the ground at each x-coordinate. And that's much more concise because the height of the ground is really all you need to know. Let's talk about the 2D array first. Now the 2D array is a little easier to think about, maybe, because it looks like the screen image and it also allows you to animate the collapses in a much more realistic way than a 1D array would allow you to. Um, the reason for that is that since the two-dimensional array uh, contains every grain of sand, it allows you to remove grains of sand and then allow the grains of sand on top of them to fall, just in the same way that uh, collapses are animated in Scorched Earth. However, there are some severe disadvantages to this. Uh, the biggest disadvantage is that it uses a lot more memory than it really should. Um, you see these numbers? Uh, they're all ones or zeros, but uh, they actually occupy much more than one bit. Uh, they have to occupy at least eight bits each. Uh, the reason for that is that the, uh, the smallest addressable unit of memory is a byte. So, depending on what language you're using, you might be able to use bytes, uh, or you might be forced to use 32-bit integers, or 64-bit floating points or whatever. Um, for example, if you were to do this in JavaScript and you made a game with a 640 by 480 screen, uh, you multiply 640 by 480 by 8 because each element contains 8 bytes and it comes out to more than 2.5 megabytes somewhere around there. Uh, so that's a huge waste of memory. The other disadvantage, um, and I'm not so sure about this because I haven't actually tried it but uh, the way that I imagine it, um, if you were to do an explosion with a 2D array, you would have to have some kind of way of telling which pixels were inside the blast radius. And I think that that would be kind of computationally expensive because it would involve going over two dimensions. Um, and you'd either do those calculations on the fly or you do them before the game started and store them in an array, which would take up even more memory. <laughs> so. Um, this method with the 2D array is just really wasteful. I don't like it at all. 
Now let's talk about the 1D array. This is much, much better because this contains only as much information as you really need to have. Now, uh, you remember how I told you that the ground is very dense below the surface? Well, that means, let's go back for a second. If you know where the surface is, you don't have to know what's under the surface because you know everything below the surface is solid ground. So why should you store all the pixels below the surface? There's no need to. And so the 1D array doesn't. It just tells you the height of the ground at each x-coordinate. Much more efficient use of memory, and uh, I believe it uses fewer calculations to do an explosion. Um, I won't get into the details right now. Um, that's for a different video, but uh, it involves the Pythagorean theorem and going over a very small section of the one-dimensional array. Uh, the one disadvantage is that uh, this doesn't allow you to animate explosions uh, in a realistic way, as in scorched earth. Um, since this doesn't give you the grains of sand, you can't very easily animate grains of sand falling in to fill empty space. So if you want to have that effect, you're going to have to write some kind of other code to supplement this. Personally, I don't really care that much. I think it, it looks just fine. Um, what you can do is you can have a, a before explosion picture and an after explosion picture, and then you can fade between pictures. I think that would be fine. Now since each x coordinate has one y value associated with it, it makes sense to use a function to generate the terrain because that's the rule of functions. For every x there's one y. Okay, so what kind of function should we use? Well, the first one I tried was a piecewise linear function, which is a fancy way of saying you draw a bunch of lines and then you calculate the uh, slope-intercept form equations, and then you use those equations to generate a single set of y values. It works well enough. Um, definitely faster than drawing a terrain with mouse strokes. And uh, the approximated curves, well, I'm not real fond of that, but some people might like it. <laughs> I'd, I'd rather have them be truly curved and look really natural. Uh, the second way I tried was with a piecewise quadratic function. And that's a way of saying that you draw a bunch of curves and they intersect and uh, you use each curve to generate a single set of y values. That looks a little nicer because the, uh, well, it's curves, you know. They look more organic. And that was also nice because that allowed you to give, um, to get very precise control of where the high points and where the low points were. It was also faster than drawing lines. But I wasn't satisfied with that, so I came up with another way. And this way is to create a polynomial from a set of points. Basically, you set a bunch of points and then you use those points to populate a matrix. And you solve the matrix uh, by, by transforming it into re reduced row echelon form. And what you get is the, a set of coefficients for a polynomial. And the polynomial passes through all the points, as you can see. That's one equation that passes through every single point. So you get perfectly round hills and valleys. Um, it's very quick and easy to use. You can also use it to generate random maps. Um, basically all you have to do is put down some random points here and there and all over the place and it'll just make a map for you. Um, it's also very, uh, the data is also very small because when you store the map you just have to save the points and everything can be regenerated from the points. And this is my favorite method. Well, uh, we're at the end of the first video. Uh, thank you for watching. I hope you'll come back to see the next video. In the next video, I'll show you how to program. Well, not exactly. I'll show you the math behind it. Uh, the code will be in the third video, and I hope you'll watch that too. Thank you. Bye-bye.